Water therapy, there's treadmill, and you, know, you miss going to the gym. And so he's actually doing. That's wonderful. That is wonderful. So, thank okay. you guys for all the thoughts and the prayers. Yeah. <laughs> so good. And, and thanks everyone who, who came yesterday. The pictures are going around. Uh, there's one extra sheet of pictures that didn't make it. I had to screw up on, on, when I was getting out of the plane this morning. But anyway, thanks everybody for coming. We had a good time. We caught uh, we caught a total of four fish and two hats. We got we got we got a phase and her mom's hats one time. On those, but that was we didn't clean those. I guess they got clean one. Anyway, that was a, that was a good time. Okay, let's go through our church wide announcements and then I'll pass around the prayer book. Okay, thank you for bringing um, bringing food. Diane is going to be gone again next week. She's in. She's done with her dad. Uh, in discovery class this week because he had his second uh, eye worked on, uh, cataract surgery. Um, and he's going to, that, that's the class he and his wife attend in Santa Fe, this discovery. So he wanted to go in person. Now next week, Diane has to work. And if anybody feels feels up to it, hey, brought food today. Oh, you got it next week? If you'll bring food next week, that'd be great. Let's go through these. Um, uh, the fellowship starts today. Come together. Wait a minute, let's see if I get you oh, something. Oh, yeah, but, uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's you, if you haven't seen if you haven't seen Heather's advertisement for Come Together, you need to see it. So anyway. So she, so she can throw our Beatles song right here. Okay, I like it. Those old rockers in the sixties. Okay, so coming together, that starts today for lunch. You can register online, which is what Laura and I did, to um, have your meal done, or they'll take a credit card or, or, or pay them. First, you've got to put it in a bucket of water. I'm going to throw it in a bucket of water. Okay, um, so that starts today. Matt Cook, uh, one of our own members, is preaching today on page 9. You'll see that, and, and the next three in the pulpit on page 9. Pastor Search Committee update, who meets in this very room. Um, is uh, on page 10. It's a good update for you to read on that one. Uh, BBS starts tomorrow. Now, I'll send a link out uh, again today. They still need food. Uh, Laura and I brought our food in today, and we just put it in the church office this morning and gave it to uh, Julie. But um, if there are, there's Thursday and Friday opening still for food needed. So I'll send that link back out again. You can sign up on Sign Up Genius and bring your food on that one. Question because it says if you're bringing food for the next day, it still has to be in the office bag. Well, just bring it in. <laughs> I think those it was, those were confusing. We, we bring in the day before, okay, and uh, bring it to the church office and put it for Thursday or something or for Friday or whatever okay. game. They'll, they'll sort that out. Yeah, we can sort it out. And that's on page 11. <laughs> Fast forward to peace. I know Laura and Anna are doing missions uh, on that particular one, so that ought to have a fun week. Yeah. Um, on page 12, uh, Blood Drive on June 29th, uh, Randy Crossland wraps up his time on the staff on page 13. Um, what can we avoid the season slowdown? Uh, Tim Morgan's got an article in here on pages 14 and 15, so take a, take a look at that. And Joe Waterfield, uh, born in Knoxville, Tennessee. I was Laura and I lived in Knoxville for a couple of years. And um, he's on page uh, 16 there. CBF General Convention on June 20th through 30th and they need volunteers. Summer schedule on 18 and ways to give on the back cover. Anything else church-wide that we need to go through on that one? Well, if not, I'm gonna pass the prayer book around. Heather, it's all yours till about 10.40. And hopefully you'll, you'll talk it right for a while. Okay, I, well, I got my phone, good. so. Well, good morning. 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 Good morning
morning. Good morning. Thank you for letting me be with you this morning. We're going to be talking and looking through the book of Esther. So that should be fun. Um, I read it in my office chair this week in, in preparation. Uh, you know, the book of Esther is intended to be read through in one sitting. So I found myself at the end wondering, well, what happens next? You know, it's very much, it's very much written um, in a in kind of story fashion, um, and it was real fun to read through. Um, so every year, many of you know that the Jewish community, uh, community reads the scroll of Esther um, aloud during the Jewish holiday Purim. So this is a two-day festival, and actually we find that at the very end of the book of Esther, them establishing that holiday. But it's a two-day festival that's often a very joyous um, feasting, drinking, sometimes costume-wearing um, holiday for our Jewish friends that is really meant to commemorate the deliverance of the Jewish people. So Purim is taken from uh, the book of Esther when uh, Haman casts lots. And so the Pur means kind of like the dice or the casting of lots. So, um, well, what I intend to do with our time today is do kind of a high-level overview of the book, um, talk about things like authorship and dating, um, where do we find ourselves uh, kind of located, uh, and then um, I know you had certain kind of scripture passages that you read um, or that you were encouraged to read. But I'm going to kind of go through um, all ten chapters a little bit, and then we'll talk about some of the questions that I think Esther really um, provides to us and some of the application. So um, you won't believe this, but they not, they're not sure who wrote the book of Esther. There's some theories out there, like many of our, our scripture texts. Um, some believe that it was Mordecai. Some believe that it was um, definitely written by a Jew who lived outside of, who, who lived in exile um, under Persian rule and who was familiar particularly with Susa and the Persian court because of the details found in the book. That's probably the greatest theory. Um, and then some believe that it was written by what they call the men of the great synagogue, which were anonymous teachers uh, who lived during this period of time. So there's no real um, consensus on who wrote the book of Esther, um, but it was probably written by a Jew who lived in exile and that knew the details of kind of the Persian Empire. So we find ourselves in the book of Esther um, that there's a Jewish community that is living during the period of exile in Susa, which is really modern day Iran. Um, and it is the heart of the Persian Empire. So um, this is about 100 years post Babylonian exile. So dating wise, if you're thinking about kind of dates and a timeline, for those of you that like that, um, the Babylonian exile was, does anybody remember the date? History lesson. <laughs> Wild okay, well, guess. 700 BC. Close. Okay. 586. Okay. So, 586 is when the Jews were exiled. Um, and then uh, Babylonian was um, conquered by uh, Sirius the Great in 539. So there, there was um, about a 200-year Persian Empire um, rule that ended in 330 uh, by Alexandria the Great, or Alexander the Great. So um, I'm going to write these up because I think hearing dates doesn't mean much unless you see them. So let me write them up here. So we have 586 is when... Um, was the exile. The story of Esther, where we, um, and the reason we know some of the dating is because of the king, King Xerxes. 
is what I'm going to call him. If anybody knows how to pronounce that, let me know. Xerxes. 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 Thank you. Um, I knew somebody would. So we find ourselves with the book of Esther. This was um, King Xerxes. And, and Susa. And then um, Sirius the Great in 539. Um, oops, sorry. Do you remember what his most known, what he was most known for? Sirius the Great. Great. Yeah, kind of the, the edict that allowed the Jews to return to their homeland, right? So in 539, this is when Sirius the Great, when his edict um, to return the Jews to their homeland. So this is where we find ourselves, which means that there were the Jewish people that lived in Susa. Remember, not all the Jewish people returned back to their homeland. There were still some that chose to remain in exile, right? So we find ourselves in this place with a Jewish community that is still living in exile. Um, there were four main books in our uh, canon that were written during this period of time. Those were Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, and Esther. So Ezra and Nehemiah, um, if you remember, show us how the, the they show how the Jewish people returned back to the land and began to rebuild. Where really you have Esther and Daniel who are living in, um, <clears throat> who are Jews that find themselves living in kind of, um, for lack of a better word, pagan kind of king's courts, right? So, um, so what do we know about how do you say his name? Xerxes? Xerxes. 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 You'd be thinking about that tonight when you get ready to hit the hay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so according to a Greek historian, he describes him this way. He describes Xerxes as the tallest and most handsome of the Persian kings, an ambitious and ruthless ruler, a brilliant warrior, and a jealous lover. He is best known for his unsuccessful invasion of Greece and was eventually assassinated by close advisors. So that's kind of historically what we know about um, this king. So um, like many stories within um, the book, or within scripture, there are some, again, historical inconsistencies um, causing some to question its authenticity, particularly why, it's, why, why it was included within the canon. I'm wondering, since this isn't your first time through the book of Esther, if you know of any, if you know of, any of these reasons, why would somebody question the book of Esther's inclusion in the canon? <clears throat> I don't think God is mentioned in it. Yeah, so that's a big one, right? <laughs> um, outside of Song of Solomon, Esther is the only book that doesn't actually mention God. Okay, so God's never mentioned. Is there any other things that you can think of about why someone might question the inclusion of Esther in the canon? Because she was a woman. Okay. <laughs> All right. Although, interestingly enough, um, yeah, yeah, and we can talk about this if we want, but I, this is, this is my hot take, personal opinion. I think that Esther becomes overshadowed by Mordecai by the end of the book, which is interesting. Um, well, she does kind of disappear, doesn't she? I mean, <laughs> yes, not literally, yes. but just not spoken of, yeah. Correct. you know, afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Which, again, we can talk about that. Um, well, she probably disappeared because, you know, three or four or five years later, somebody prettier came along, and the harem just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> or the new queen, or whatever. I mean, that's just the way it worked. Mm. Like it or not. Yeah. yeah. Then her, but her story was told yeah. in detail, so that was done. 
Yeah. So that's something to be she, happy about. You know, that it, yeah. And yeah. She, she personally kept going back to Mordecai <clears throat> for our words of wisdom. So maybe that's not a part. It might be a part of why he was remembered too. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. They all have a place in the story, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the other reasons, you won't believe who wanted to discard Esther, but it was Martin Luther. One of the reasons he um, she talks about this was, well, I'll read you the quote. It says, I am so great an enemy to the second book of the Maccabees and to Esther that I wish they had not come to us at all, for they have too many heathen unnaturalities. So some of what, um, some of what people's concern about the book of Esther is not only that it doesn't mention God throughout the text, but that it also really highlights the moral ambiguity of the characters. So if you think about, um, there seems to be an abandonment to the Torah. There is, if you remember, Esther hides her Jewish identity. So there is a lot of lying that occurs. Um, we can talk about the end of the book where there is a lot of violence, where the Jews were basically given free reign to kill. Um, there was, uh, we can talk about kind of the, the sexual aspect of the book of Esther, particularly in that first and second chapter. Um, the feasting and drinking. Um, so there was just a lot of ambiguity morally that Martin Luther um, particularly feels concerned about it being included. I don't think there would be a whole lot of effort involved in finding a dozen examples of just those things <laughs> before you get to Esther, starting in Genesis. Sure. So yeah. that seems like an odd criticism on his part. Well, he was kind of an odd guy, right? Sure. Yeah, he was a little odd himself. Maybe these, okay, so this is like, pause. Maybe he was projecting some of his own, what was going on in his own life, you know? Like, we sometimes we react against some of the very own things that we struggle with. Oh, sure. So, hot take, but that's my, nice. yeah. Um, so let's talk about this, um, this that, that God has never mentioned <coughs> in the book. Um, some people think it's actually a brilliant technique used by the author. And the reason why is that it serves as an invitation for us to look for God's activity. Um, so we'll talk about that some as we get into the scriptures, but um, into the text. Um, it makes us wrestle with this question of what do we do when we feel as if God is absent? Is God present even when we feel like God is absent? Um, it uh, establishes kind of this notion of God's providence, right? That in some invisible way, God still governs all creatures and circumstances and actions, um, even when perhaps we, we can't see it or name it. You can see how that would appeal to the Jewish people in exile, uh, <coughs> the notion of providence of something because yeah. something you can't see, but it's mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but the book of Esther is full of ironic kind of reversals and coincidences. So again, can is that part of God's working, right? So some some people call Esther the book of great reversal. Um. And a lot of that is how it's structured, and so we'll talk about, we'll go through that. Um, I never thought about it before, but um, Esther, to some degree, is kind of like David when he killed Goliath. Young kid didn't know, he shows up and goes out and fights the battle, and you know she showed up kind of how she got directed to be to be at the mm -hmm. hearing anyway, but she went out as the prettiest of all, so she became queen. And then she had to go out and not fight Goliath, but basically her life was at stake too, depending upon her mm. uh, answering the questions. Yes, absolutely. So somewhat the same. Now, she didn't become king, so at the end of her deal, they didn't you know, make, make her king, but the queen wasn't bad, so she did not have the long, <laughs> the long life that David had, but you know, she had some of the same early yeah. uh, you know, situations. Yeah. 
Well, let's look at the structure of the book of Esther and talk about kind of this great reversal. So in chapter one, um, we see, um, you know, the introduction of the king of Persia, his greatness in regards to these large feasts that he threw. Um, and then we also um, have, we're also introduced uh, very quickly, both entrance and exit to Queen Vashti. Um, so what do you, what do you remember about Queen Vashti? She was the queen before Esther and was, fell out of favor with the king. Mm -hmm. Why? She made lots of beauty. <laughs> well, she didn't, didn't go. She didn't play long. Yeah, <laughs> she, she didn't play <laughs> So, so she got real ugly. <laughs> this was uh, really interesting. In fact, so Vashti was summoned by the king. And she said no. Like, I'm not going to come into, your pre into the presence. <laughs> Now, some people, you know, she probably was summoned for um, reasons that we may not want to discuss, right? It wasn't just because people wanted to see her. It was maybe she was summoned sexually, right? Mm -hmm. And she decided to take a stand and say no. But what's really silly is what comes out of that. Not only does her death result, right? We don't know actually what happens to her, but most people believe she was killed. Um, but then there become, there's this decree that goes out. Because what they're afraid of is that all the other women in the empire are going to get into, that, that something's going to, that they're going to begin to disobey, right? And to, to begin to start saying no. Feminism. Yeah. <laughs> so this decree goes out that basically mandates Right, that all of um, all of the women. Let me see if I can find it. Let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be altered. That Vashti is never to come before the king. Um, so when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. Right. So it's about reestablishing order. Um, which it. It's just kind of silly, um, but so that's what happens in chapter one. So it begins off by this, uh, you see kind of this great feasting, and then you have death and decree, right? And then in chapter two, we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. So we know that Esther was an orphan raised by Mordecai, which, is, um, which was her older cousin. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is when they go through, um, kind of, it's been described in different ways, but basically a, a beauty pageant, right? Who's the most, but it takes them a year. Um, if, you, if you read closely enough, um, all of these virgins are, uh, beautiful young virgins are in the harem. Um, and their cosmetic treatments, uh, which basically means for six months they, oil and myrrh, put oil and myrrh on themselves, and then for six months, they kind of live uh, with, there's a process, uh, what was it called, of like incense, burning incense where they sit in this, so that your body basically smells of these, in so anyway, it's a, it's a long process, it wasn't like she came to the harem and then was chosen the next day. So it's kind of like early deodorant, right? <laughs> I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Tough go. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing they were doing to Daniel and all the all the men put on the diet. You know. Sure, you know, yeah. Make them look as pretty as they can and smell good and eat the right stuff. And, you know. Yeah. Oh. Um, so Esther actually means star. It's Persian, um, and it means star. It's that, I like the meaning of names. Um, so she was taken into the king's palace. Um, everything that happens to Esther up until this point, Esther is a, is a passive actor or actress up into the story, right? Everything is being done to her, or she's being given to someone, or um, so she's not taking an active role in the story at this point in time. Um, so um, she is the prettiest of all, and he makes her queen. 
Um, what's important to remember, though, is when the king brings these virgins before him, he takes their virginity, which basically means that they are no longer allowed to be anyone else's husband or wife. Mm -hmm. So not only is he just taking and basically raping these, these virgins, but he's also destroying the rest of their life. Um, Esther is found to be the most beautiful of all, and so he makes her queen. Um, and then there's that interesting last section that Mordecai discovers this plot, where he hears at the gate um, two, of his two of the king's advisors um, are looking to conspire to assassinate him. So Mordecai reports that, and it's written in kind of the chronicles, right? It's written down to be remembered that Mordecai saved the king's life. <clears throat> okay, so chapter three, we're introduced to Haman, which is basic, he's like the, the prime minister of the kingdom. He's the, the highest king's advisor. Um, the, the interesting thing about Haman um, is that it labels him an Agagite. So um, that's important because I want you to flip over to 1 Samuel 15. Okay, so Mordecai comes from the tribe of Benjamin. He's a Benjaminite. Haman comes from the, from the tribe of the Agagites. Uh, 1 Samuel 15. Which are... Um, which was the first um, king. So at King Ag, Agag, 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 I don't know how else you would say that, Agag, Agag. Um, he is the king of the Amicalites. So if you see in 1 in, uh, Samuel 15, um, I'm going to read a little bit, verse, verses 8 and 9. So Saul, who is the first king, right, of the Israelites, of the people, um, he gets word from Samuel um, that the Lord has anointed you king over his people, um, and he says this, I will punish the Amicalites for what they did in opposition uh, in opposing the Israelites when they come up out of Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul goes, and in verse 8, you'll see that he disobeyed the Lord's command because he spares King Agag. 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 So in verse 8, he said, He took King Agag of the Amicalites alive, but utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Saul and the people spared him um, and the best of the sheep and the cattle and the fatlings and the lambs and all that was valuable. So um, in verse 15 through 34, we basically see that Samuel calls out Saul and says, why did you not, why did you not obey the Lord's command? The Lord anointed you king and he sent you on a mission that was this, go and utterly destroy the Amicalites. Why did you not then obey the voice of the Lord? And basically, the end of that chapter ends by, with the Lord saying that he was sorry that he made Saul king over Israel. And that um, the, this people group, the, the descendants of Agag, will always be kind of a thorn in the flesh of the Jewish people. So that's why Haman is so important, and why it says that he is a descendant, he is an Agagite. Okay, so it's kind of setting this up, right? Mordecai is comes from the comes from the same tribe that Saul comes from, the tribe of Benjamin. Haman is coming from um, the Amicalites, and it's already it's kind of already setting this story up. So just a small detail that is kind of important. Um, <clears throat> so Haman gets all. He gets all, you know, angry and upset because he doesn't bow, um, bow before uh, the king. So um, Mordecai did not bow down. Um, he gets upset and says, why do you disobey the king's command? Um, <coughs> and then um, he, he decides uh, in, in chapter 3 that the decree is going to go out for the utter destruction of all Jewish people. So he talks to the king about that. Let a decree be issued for their destruction. Um, 
<clears throat> and so they did that, and it was on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. So that is, um, let me make sure I got all this. Okay, yep. So then it goes back to um, Esther and Mordecai in verse 4. <laughs> and this is the first time that we see Esther actually be an active participant in the story. Um, so this is when Mordecai basically, and you'll remember that Mordecai instructed Esther to, to not reveal her Jewish identity, right? Um, and now he's coming to her and he's saying, for if you keep silent, so they, there's this, you know, he tears his clothes and he cries at the king's gate. Um, everybody's been notified that the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews are going to be annihilated, right? And so Mordecai approaches Esther. And he says, For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Right? Classic. Classic verse from, from Esther. Um, and then Esther says, this is, this is where she begins to be an active participant. Right? Esther says, in reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, right? So she knows that even going to the king, her life is going to be taken at risk because the king has to summon you, or if you go to the king, he holds out a scepter, and then you're allowed to speak. But she doesn't know if that... She doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. <coughs> um, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So then we get to chapter 5, which is when Esther summons Haman and the king to the first banquet. She, did, she has two different banquets that she does with the, with the king and, and Haman. <coughs> so... Um, <coughs> So Esther approached and touched the top of the scepter, and the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? And instead of taking the moment, that moment to ask for the save, saving of the, her people, she says, I'd like to summon you and Haman to another banquet. So they came um, back. So they come back after, yep, in chapter 7. So, um... So then, um, Haman, again, wants Mordecai hanged, right? He builds this gallows and um, wants, really wants to hang Mordecai. <laughs> so in chapter 6, chapter 6 of, um, <laughs> chapter 6 of the story is when it pivots. So this is when we begin to see the elevation of Mordecai and Haman's downfall. Right? So everything up until this point. Um, so, um, and it starts off by, you know, you would think if somebody saved your life, you'd kind of like remember their name. <laughs> right? Like, you would, I mean, I guess maybe it happens all the time if you're king. I don't know. I guess, I guess many people want to take your life. But the fact that Mordecai was written in the an annals or the, the, the chronicles of story um, is, is fascinating. So in chapter 6, it begins by saying, by talking about um, the king couldn't sleep, and so he, he had these uh, scrolls read to him. And the particular story or the particular occurrence that was read to him was the story about Mordecai and how Mordecai saved his life. So the next day, Ham Haman is summoned, and the king asks, what are we doing to honor this person? This, this person saved my life. What are we doing to honor him? Um, and he is instructed, basically, <laughs> Haman is instructed to then lead Mordecai around on a royal horse with royal robes and to give him great honor, right? Ooh, that's a slap in the face when you've just built a gallows for the same person to be hanged. Um, so, um, 
So then we pivot into, right, so there's that great ironic reversal. And the, and the, the story begins to pivot from there on out. So in, verse, or in chapter 7, Esther throws her second banquet, where she, um, this, is the, this is the point in which she finally reveals her Jewish identity and asks the king to save the people, to save the Jews. Um, but she doesn't reveal who, at first she doesn't reveal um, who instructed the, um, the annihilation. Um, and so the king asks, <coughs> who is he? And she says, it's him, right? So um, we know that once decrees are, are set in motion, they can't be reversed. So in verse 8, although um, Haman is, is sent to his death, he's no longer, that decree is still in place, right? So at this point in time, although the person is no longer, the fear, the, the ability, you know, the fear of the Jewish, the annihilation of the Jewish people is still in place. Mm -hmm. So in chapter 8, that's when... Um, you really see how Mordecai and Esther come together to save the Jews. <clears throat> by, by, um, by ordering a counter decree that on the same month, on the 12th, what is it? The 12th day of the, yep, 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, um, a counter decree, they ask for a counter decree that the Jews... Um, would be able to defend themselves against anyone who has plotted to kill them. Um, and so that is, that is issued. And then you see in verse 9 kind of the destruction and the violence of um, the enemies of the Jews. Um, and then interestingly enough, in verse 13, you see Esther asking for one more day to allow, um, to be allowed also tomorrow to do according to the day's edict and let the 10 sons of Hammond be hanged on the gallows. So um, again, another point of detail of moral ambiguity, right? We often think of Esther as this like woman mm -hmm. of valor and, and she is, but here she is again requesting one more day to kill Interesting. Okay. So then the last, um, you know, the last part of that is the, is the Feast of Purim um, inaugurated. And it talks about kind of the, the holiday itself and that it should be something that all generations practice. Um, and that's kind of the end of the story of Esther. So Thank good. you, Heather. So good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Heather. Appreciate that. Oh. This, this story is Heather. <laughs> As Heather Colson has read uh, at Temple Emmanuel, and Brad Sham reads it, and they the audience cheers for the for the you know for Mordecai and, and, and Esther and booze at Haman and stuff like it's really an amazing <laughs> thing to hear and see. What time um, is that? What, I don't remember when they do it. I think it. it's in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go through the prayer request, and if we need to add some, there are some pictures from the party yesterday that are going around. Some of you guys that came in late, you might want to. Oh, here they are. Look, look, pass them back down to these guys. I'll do it. And um, I'll, I'll I'll send these uh, out uh, this afternoon when I send the uh, lesson link. Um, and we we'll go from there. Let's go, let's go through the prayer requests that we have here. Of course, we want to pray for the pastor search committee. What wonderful news about Robert Kung being able to go home on Wednesday. Um, he, saw, he told us that he would, he's either going home or going to heaven, and he didn't care which. So he's uh, got great faith. Um, Susie McLaughlin is traveling. She needs our prayer. She's traveling to Chicago with her grandchildren, so that's uh, she probably needs some special help on that one. So, uh, and then, of course, VBS this week for the teachers and the children on, uh, this week on Vacation Bible School. Uh, anything else? Any other prayer requests we need to add to the to the list? And let's pray. Heather, thanks so much for teaching us. We appreciate you. Let's pray. Oh, oh, I do want to add two things. Uh, uh, one thing, Diana's father, Paul, uh, had his cataract surgery, came out well, but he, he's not flying back until he gets, I think he has to recover for a week, but we'll add that to the list. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come and hear and listen and read your scripture. 
and understand stories that are sometimes ambiguous, but uh, that's somewhat what our lives are like as well. Father, we thank you for the time and preparation that Heather put into the lesson and for um, us to be able to, to hear that today. Father, we pray for the, for the pastor search committee. We pray for discernment, for stamina, for wisdom uh, as they go through the process with that um, to find our next pastor and prepare the heart of our next pastor that um, there might be a good fit uh, here for us. Father, we pray a uh, prayer of thanksgiving for Robert, uh, getting stronger every day, and for the, uh, the hopefulness of being able to go home on Wednesday. We pray for Susie McLaughlin as she's traveling by car with her grandchildren to Chicago, and give them safe travels and a uh, good time together. We also pray for the Vacation Bible School teachers and children this week, that um, the children might listen and be attentive, and the teachers have the strength and energy as they go through um, and lead them. We pray for Diana Early's father, Paul, um, as he recovers from his second cataract surgery, and give him a good recovery and a uh, safe trip home to Santa Fe. Father, we pray for our staff. We thank you for um, Wilshire itself, um, and guide our staff and lead them as they lead us. And help us to be your hands and feet in this part of the world. And I we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.